we've always been standing on holy ground. That's the topic that we're going to discuss today as we hear about the vision of Base Church over the next little while. And we're going to talk about vision in a way that will hopefully reignite uh, hopes and whatever God's been doing in your spirit. The reality is, is that we're living in a time, a world, and a space that uh, doesn't always feel encouraging to us as Christians, as people that believe um, that God wants to move even in our country during this time and this day and this age. I think that sometimes it's actually discouraging us. You know, local churches right now are suffering. We see more pastors uh, quitting ministry or retiring ministry or um, moving on from the ministry, then we see pastors actually coming in. We see that attendance across the board is actually decreasing in the Canadian church. Congregations are without leaders. Buildings and properties are being sold to cash flow the mission of God. And uh, many times these buildings and these properties um, are, are, are losing their zoning and therefore there is a really low chance as our society continues to grow and inflation, inflation continues to grow that the church will ever get some of these properties back. Secular theology is prevalent and it's um, often going uncontested in certain minds and hearts of people. And, and I think that these are some of the things that sometimes when we look at it, we become discouraged and we think, God, where are you in times like these? Do we really live in a post-Christian society? Is it possible to even envision a pre-Christian society? But it's not just Christianity that has taken its hits over the last little while. We see society as a whole is also suffering. We see that there's a mental health crisis going on and um, in many ways, it seems to be uh, going and um, growing uh, without any hope of actually defeating it. Ideolo ideological wars persist, and there's increased polarity. In fact, we, we now know that this is the way in which most social media giants are building their companies based on the polarization of you and I conf conflicted with our neighbors and our friends and our family. There's foundational institutions that are in upheaval. There's values that are undefined and not agreed upon. There's, there's not a common value set for our nation anymore. There's not an identity that we can place our hope in. And as all of this goes on, there's a world that desperately needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I wonder if we as a church even have the hope for the cry of the world that we currently find ourselves in. I want to read for us uh, uh, here on Vision Sunday to Exodus chapter 3. A story that many of us are familiar with, but maybe if you're not, we're going to pick up the story where a guy named Moses, who was an Israelite, part of ancient Israel, who um, was commanded, his, his people were commanded to be killed. All the young boys and, and uh, uh, during this time were commanded uh, to be killed. But uh, this one Israelite uh, mother put her son in a basket and he actually ended up in Pharaoh's household. And so this little boy named Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household. And for all intents and purposes, we believe he was given a good education, a good living. Um, he seemed to be a part of the family. At least these are the things that we read into the text. At a certain point, Moses grew up to start to understand that he wasn't the same as the Egyptians. In fact, he himself was an Israelite. And at the time, Israelites were under captivity. They were slaves to the Egyptians. And one day he goes out and he sees a fellow Israelite um, uh, being beaten by an Egyptian slave driver. And, and responding to the injustice that he sees in front of him, he actually goes and he kills the Egyptian. Well, this uh, rather than earning him favor with his, uh, with his own countrymen, with his own heritage, uh, he actually is, is called out for it. And, and large in part likely because uh, they had watched Moses grow up in Pharaoh's household and there's likely some jealousy at play. And so rather than supporting what Moses does, uh, they actually come against it. And we see that Moses flees for quite a period of time where he uh, uh, meets his wife, he, he um, uh, comes into contact with an incredible father-in-law, and uh, he becomes a shepherd. Interestingly, that most of the people that God uses both in the Old Testament and the New Testament are either shepherds or described as shepherds, but maybe that's a message for another day. In Exodus chapter three, we see this shepherd named Moses attending to his flock. And in chapter three, verse one, it says this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. 
So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse seven continues. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And in some interesting way, what we see God responding to here is the injustice that filled Moses that caused him to act. And, and Moses isn't reprimanded for his previous actions, but here we see actually God redirecting the passion that he once had, and he's actually redirecting it to be able to be actually used to respond to the cry of God's people. He says, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. We've always been standing on holy ground. As I come into this space, I'm sensitive to the weight of all that God has done here. We're at base Bloomingdale. And Bloomingdale has been a place that has been on God's radar and a place that he's been moving for quite some time. You know, one of the aspects that we've been talking about as a staff is that it seems that as Waterloo Region begins to grow up, the spaces that are outside seem to sometimes feel a little disconnected from the busyness and the hustle and the bustle of the city. And yet, here at BASE, our leadership has been talking about the idea of what if BASE Bloomingdale, what if Bloomingdale specifically was a destination for people where their souls could find a retreat, a solace, a place of rest, encouragement, direction, to be sent back out into the mission field, the, the places that people feel called. And you know, the reality is, is that God has been moving on this property for decades now. And we're not the first, the base Bloomingdale and those that have joined in the last few years or maybe in the last few months, we're not the first to dream up God dreams on this property. And we won't be the last. And I'm overcome by the fact that this, this space, the space I'm speaking from right now, is holy ground, has been holy ground, will be holy ground that God is using to further his mission here in this region, this province, this nation, and on this planet. The call that Moses got from God was ultimately gonna come at a cost. It would have Moses on the run, It'd have Moses questioning his identity. It'd have Moses questioning his skills and working through insecurity. It'd have Moses being threatened by, his, by God's people. It'd have Moses up against world and, and nation leaders and empire leaders. It'd have Moses putting his life on the line. It'd have Moses receiving quite a cost. And, and the reality is, is that holy ground comes at a cost. The, the words that are spoken on holy ground, the call that is received on holy ground comes at a cost. And I think of all the, the, the costs that has been occurred here in Bloomingdale by people that have sacrificed and people that have given time and energy and resources and finances and given up mortgage savings and given up vacation savings and given up uh, investments and, and invested so that they could give. And I think of all of the investment that has been given here in Bloomingdale and I go, it was not for nothing. It was actually so that God could continue to move. I've obviously been doing some studying about what God has done here in Bloomingdale. 
And as I came across some of the worship albums, actually Bryce gave a few of them to me, but finally I found a CD player. You know how hard it is to find a CD player these days? Finally popped it in and one of the songs that just struck me is the song, Let This Be A Place. I wasn't sure who was singing. It's Pastor Steve Fleming, founder of Koinonia, which became Bass Bloomingdale. And the lyrics, let this be a place where your spirit's moving. Let this be a place where your glory dwells. Let this be a place where we are drawn together. Let this be a place where your healing flows. Let this be a place where every heart is open. Let this be a holy place. And then I love the declaration, not just let this, but we will. We'll be a place where your name is worshiped and adored. We'll be a place where your word is honored and declared. We'll be a place where we live in the fear of the Lord. So that this will be a holy, a holy place. We will be a holy place. That's what we're talking about here. I'm amazed at the fact that not only was this ground used to write worship songs for the church and for Bloomingdale and Koinonia as, as a group of people, but then behind the projector here at uh, the projection screen here at Bloomingdale, where all of a sudden a production company birthed out of David Kuabera's heart um, uh, began to take place and, and a, another guy named Nathan Finocchio came along and, and after that, a, a production company called The Jacks was born and as Nathan began to move on from that and David Kubera uh, moved on, somebody, uh, another name that some of you will recognize, Brian Voss would take the mantle and he would actually set up the studio in the basement in the Arts, uh, Arts Academy wing. And after um, Brian moved on, Everett Wood would take on the mantle. And after that, Jacob Voss, and most recently sitting down with dinner with Derek and, and Zoe Voss, and, and Derek saying that he's gonna join the production team. And there's always been a mantle that's been passed, a, a baton that has been passed, and all of that ne to the next generation to continue to worship God in this space. I can't wait to see what God's gonna do. Because not only what God uh, did in this space reach out to the people that attended Koinonia for years, but then there were songs that were written behind a projection screen that went out and reached the entire world. Songs like Praise Him from Hillsong United were written in this space. And I just wonder, like, what does God want to do in this space? It's a place that's been set apart. It's uncommon ground, space where people have learned and went to school and had gym class, a space where people have worshiped God, a place where, where uh, Christmas productions have been put on and, and the gospel has been displayed and proclaimed and all the rest. But what does God want to do with this holy ground into the future? I can't begin to understand all that God has prepared for us here in Bloomingdale and across Base Church. But one thing I do know is that God has set our church in a direction that if we are willing to stay faithful, keep margin available, that God is gonna to continue to speak words of life into our church. And one of the things that I've been sensing really deeply in my soul and something that for years I have told the church that I was pastoring, Slate, that has also become Base City and Base University. One of the things that, that, that I've been holding off on is, guys, no, we're not gonna write songs and release it. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna allow this to become bigger than what it needs to be in this season, but there's something about Base Church now that I believe God's saying, hey, it's time. Get back to writing, get back to proclaiming, get back to declaring who I am. Let it be a gift to the church in Canada. I'm not sure what that means, but I know it's a direction. What's gonna happen? I don't know when we, when we pursue this direction, but I believe that God is gonna do something special. I wanna talk about this concept of holy ground for just a moment, because the reality is, is that we have always been standing on holy ground. You know, as we've been coming into Vision Sunday, um, I've been a little bit nervous, and that's not, 
That's not something that's different. I feel the weight of a Sunday like this. I feel the weight of a season that we're going into. Some of us are still trying to get our heads wrapped around Heart for the House and what that is. And Heart for the House is just our season where we talk about, as base Church, where we're gonna be talking about vision for our church, personal finances, and it's all gonna culminate in one final Sunday where we actually go above and beyond our regular giving. And on May 5th, we're actually gonna to gather together and we're gonna to give towards all that we believe that God wants to do through our church. And the reason that this feels so weighty is obvious, of course. For some of us, we've been through seasons like this, maybe at another church or maybe in the location that we were attending before uh, Base Church became a merge of both Slate and Koinonia. Maybe you've been through this. Maybe you know what it looks like to give above and beyond. Or maybe for the first time you're being stirred to give to the church at all. Whatever it is, my hope and my prayer through this Sunday and the weeks that precede this is that you'll get a vision not only for what Base Church and where God is calling Base Church, and where it's gonna go, but also for what God might be calling you to in your life. And that call all starts with holy ground. Because reality is, is that we've always been standing on holy ground. As I consider what we see out of Moses in this passage, one of the things that's really interesting is it says that Moses saw, uh, saw though the bush was on fire, that it did not burn up. Interestingly, when you're in the presence of God, um, one of the things that's required of us is not just to notice that the presence of God is around us and that we find ourselves in the presence of God, but it's to develop a curiosity when God is moving. He not only saw that a bush was on fire, but he took note that it did not burn up. It was more than just an odd situation, something more odd than just a, a bush fire was, was happening. The bush wasn't burning up. And so Moses takes the next step of curiosity and he thinks to himself, I will go over and and see this strange sight. Why this bush does not burn up. You know, our church in many ways has found itself in consistent places where we have, we have been on holy ground. The reality is, is we have always been standing on holy ground. district. I'm here at Maxwell's, a place that God has used for your location over the last 10 years in the story that he's writing here at Base Church. Maxwell's has always been a place near and dear to my heart because when we started ministry, Emma and I were pastoring a student church called the Embassy on Monday nights. And as I was pastoring that church, there was a uh, a, a couple of guys from our church that were actually playing in a band that was playing on the small side of Maxwell's. If you're not familiar with it, behind this closed doors here, we have about a third of the building. And then on this side of the closed doors, uh, garage doors, we have two thirds of the building. So the band was playing on that side and I was actually needing to use the bathroom. And as I walked back to the bathroom, um, I began to realize that, that actually the space was a lot larger than, um, than what we, than I even realized. So as I wandered over here, it became very clear. All of a sudden, I could see a church service happening in this space. Um, at the time, we weren't in this space, and as I was dreaming about this, as I was remaining curious as to what God was up to, all of a sudden, the owner, Paul Maxwell, came and found me and said, hey, what are you doing over here? It took some time of convincing uh, him that I was actually indeed a pastor and not just some young punk that was here for a concert. But as we began to engage in a conversation, it became apparent based on the prices that we were being given that I don't know if this was actually gonna work. But by the end of that conversation with very little negotiation, it was almost as if uh, Paul was having a conversation with the Holy Spirit because the price that he offered at the end of the day was 20% of what he'd initially told me at the beginning of that conversation. In fact, he suggested that we would become partners, that we could actually um, use one another's uh, things, like chairs and tables and pipe and drape, and, and what if we did this and what? All of a sudden, we engaged in a conversation of, of how we could actually use the space together and how we might be able to use it for one day out of the week so he wouldn't have to worry about that. Walking into this space, it was just another space in Waterloo, but God seemed to be doing something 
in that moment. That, that little extra curiosity, that little extra curiosity that it would encourage all of us to have in our spirits, it enabled God to use this space. And, and I just, I can't help but think like, what are the other spaces in our region, but also in Ontario, that God might be asking us to be a little bit more curious about. Hey, maybe I just might wanna do something here down the road. You know, it was so great because that summer we moved in here as a student church, but it wouldn't be too long before we launched Slate Church, not on Monday nights when Embassy was, but on Sunday nights. It's all we knew how to do. The people that were coming to our church, their friends would only come to an evening service, and then it would become one of the locations of Base Church. You know, the reality is, is that God has used this space to reach countless university students. As the nations come to this region, we have reached the nations in this space, and they have gone out and have reached the spaces that they came from for Jesus. We have baptized countless people in, in a cow trough just behind me here. We've seen many people give their lives to Jesus. We've seen this as, a, as an HQ to a lot of the serving that we've done on the campuses during the pandemic, the Slate location, the, the, this is as a location of Slate, was actually used to film all of the things that were done in the pandemic. I just wonder what God might wanna do in this space in the future of Base Church. And I wonder what the curiosity that exists in this space might do as we look to further spaces that God wants to use here in Ontario. Even where we stand right now is holy ground. It's the third part of this story where a, a, a young church seven years ago started out to make a difference in this community. It really started with a simple dream to reach people that I didn't believe would, would come out to church. I, I grew up in the hockey community. I'd play hockey with friends. We'd have intense uh, conversations in the showers afterwards in a hockey game, sometimes talking to men about the fact that their wife had suffered a miscarriage and trying to bring the hope of Christ into a moment that seemed so awkward and wondering whether or not this person would ever step foot inside a church at all. And in that, Slate Church was born. You know, Slate Church for a long time was a nomadic church. It was a mobile church. It was a church without a home. Uh, one of our taglines that we'd often say is you can attend Slate Church as long as you can find it where we are. Because the reality is, is that in our, our seven years of being a church, we had uh, nearly 10 different uh, locations that we actually spent as a church. And I remember a season where we were looking for a church and we were looking to see, God, could you just bring us into, um, could you bring us into a, a new space? Could you, could you provide us a space? It's time for us to grow beyond just an office space and a, a rented space. But we love an HQ where we could have a medium sized space where throughout the week we could gather together and worship together and have leadership nights together. And so we went on this wild goose chase all around the city looking for a space. I remember um, that one of the last spaces that we looked for, uh, looked at was this industrial condo building where we thought, hey, if we actually buy this for what we think we could buy it for, we could actually rent out the other four spaces, use one of the spaces for our own office space, use it as a space to worship, and maybe we could take over all the other spaces before we get there, and we're really leaning into this idea. Interestingly enough, even in this season, before we had merged, uh, Jamie Kubasek was our realtor, and he was helping walk us through this stage, and then all of a sudden we got a call that would change everything. And the call came right after Emma received a prophetic vision while we were at an art conference, the same group that we had launched Slate Church out of. And she, we went up to the front. She just felt this word over our church that before the birth of the baby that she was currently pregnant with, that we would be given a building. And so I got this call from a man named Neil Cudney. He was the president of Emmanuel Bible College. And he said, hey, I don't know if you're still looking for space, but I, wish, I, I hope that we could just have a, a chat. Would you give me a call back? I ran downstairs and I said to Emma, I said, Emma, I think that this is the answer to our prayers. I think for some reason, God is going to, we're, we're actually going, God is going to enable us to actually purchase the building at 100 Fergus at Emmanuel Bible College. There's no indication given of that. There's nothing said about that in the voicemail. But Ben, uh, who is now our executive director of logistics here at, um, at, at Base Church, uh, we went into that meeting and would, wouldn't you know it, but they were interested in selling us the building. You know, it's interesting is that you know, right now I, I, sit, I stand in that space, this space that at one point was a dream that maybe we could just have our own space where we could worship God in a permanent location and all the rest. You know, the reality is, is that before we ever stepped in this place, it was already holy ground. 
You know, uh, what we know it as before Slate Church bought it, we know it as Emmanuel Bible College. But before that, it was actually a campground owned by the EMCC, EMCC, the Evangelical Missionary Church of Canada. Before that, it was actually revival grounds for a couple of different denominations that would eventually amalgamate. And 100 years ago, they would set up tents on this very property that I'm standing right now. This cement slab is laid over a piece of ground that was used over a century ago for revival meetings for a denomination that was starting to see growth and revival happen here in Canada. People from Pennsylvania, out west, out east, in Ontario, would gather on this space to worship the one true God. It was turned into a campground where this was the, ta the tabernacle. It was turned into a chapel and then a library that was used for a Bible college that raised up missionaries and pastors and sent them all over the world. And now, we're standing once again, not on new holy ground, but on holy ground that will be used as a sanctuary that will worship our God. We have always been standing on holy ground. The reality is, is that when you're standing on holy ground, just like Moses did, we must take greater curiosity than just what we're seeing with face value. We can't just look at it and go, God, thank you that we get to have this space and thank you that, that we now don't have to rent facilities or, or thank you, God, that, that we wrote music in this space or thank you, God, that we get to rent this close to the university campus or thank you, God. All of that is great stuff and in and of itself, just the story is a miracle. But what would happen if we just took a little bit more curiosity? What might God God want to do through Base Church if we just looked a little bit deeper. God, thank you for this holy ground that I'm currently standing in, but what do you want to do in this area of Kitchener? What is it that you're up to here in the Waterloo region that you want us positioned right here for such a time as this? God, thank you for this wonderful facility in Bloomingdale, but God, what is it that you want us to do right now? What are you up to? What is it? What are the things that you would have us to do right now? God, thank you for the space in the middle of a university town, but God, who are the lost sons and daughters that you want to bring home? What would it look like for those of us that recognize that God is clearly up to something, it's visible to our eyes, what would it look like for us to gather a little bit deeper of a curiosity and go, God, I'm not just interested that you're doing a miracle, but I wanna know what you might be saying through it to me and to our church and what you have for us in the future. One of the phrases that has captivated my heart in this past season is the idea of being called to a people. You see, the reality is that Moses didn't just get a, a, a fanciful show or, or a, a get to watch a miracle of God as this bush didn't burn up. But in the midst of the bush, actually, and, and, and the curiosity that Moses took, God speaks to Moses out of the bush and he says, Moses, Moses. He makes it personal. All of a sudden, holy ground becomes very personal. Moses, Moses. Brandon, Brandon, I'm trying to speak to you. And as he begins to identify to Moses that this is holy ground, all of a sudden, he begins to address the cry of the Israelite people that Moses had obviously been crying out for, but the people themselves stuck in captivity in Egypt have been crying out for centuries, for 400 years. And in the midst of this, God says, hey, I have heard their cry and I have come down to rescue them. And I think for a lot of us, when we hear that God wants to move in a place that we've been crying out for quite some time, we get really excited about that. But as we read a little bit further, he says, so I'm gonna do something about it. But what he says in verse 10 is he says, so now go, I'm sending you. Isn't it interesting that God's response to answering the cry of the Israelite people is actually to send Moses? The thing is, is that when we're crying out to God and we're praying out to him, do you realize that often you are the answer to the prayer that you're praying? God, may you move in our nation again. Guess what? You might be an answer to that prayer. God, could you move in Waterloo Region? Well, maybe you just might be an answer to that prayer. But the thing that is fascinating to me is that God is not just calling people to positions or he's not just calling people to ministry or he's not just calling people to a specific gift. What he's calling you to is he's calling you to a people. The reality about calling, and this is something that Jim Cimbala says at the Brooklyn Tabernacle, is he says calling is always tied to somebody else's cry. Somebody cries out and God sends a person to answer that cry. Our calling is always attached to the cry of somebody else. Somebody right now in this city is crying out for help. Somebody's crying out because they're lonely. Somebody's crying out because they don't think life is worth living. And guess what? Your call is attached to somebody else's desperation. And God is about to send you into the place. He's not waiting for somebody else to come to this 
region. He's not waiting for somebody else to join this church. He wants to use you and I and the thing that he is already up to in this region. And he's saying, hey, the people are crying. Will you be an answer? Go, I am sending you. You know, we were made for more than just the Canadian dream. We were made for more than just dreaming of greater possibilities. We were made for more than just bigger houses and early retirement and, 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 and better places to relax, whether out south or at cottages. You know, we were made for more than the Canadian dream. In fact, we weren't just made for the Canadian dream. We were made for eternity. We were made to spend eternity with Christ. But part of that is understanding that we weren't just made individually to spend time with Christ. We were made to bring others into that same saving faith. One of the words that was spoken over uh, myself early in ministry, at this time I was pastoring the embassy, a student movement here in Waterloo Region that had an incredible, an incredible history here in the region of reaching students, specifically at Waterloo University, but also at Wilfrid Laurier. And as I was pastoring that church and we were getting ready to transition that and getting ready to plant Slate Church, there was, um, we had a speaker come, Nathan Finocchio. And after Nathan Finocchio was um, done speaking, his sister came up to the platform. Some of you might know her, her name's Tiffany Voss. And uh, she reached out to, to, to uh, receive the mic from me. This wasn't a planned moment, but out of not even knowing what I was doing, all of a sudden I found myself handing the mic to somebody at the time I didn't even know. And this is the only time this has ever happened in ministry. And I, I can't say that I was actually intentionally doing this. But all of a sudden, my mic goes from my hand into the hand of a woman that I had only met a few moments ago. And she starts to speak a prophetic word over myself, but also over the, the, the leaders that I was leading at the time. And one of the things she said in this prophetic word is she said, you're going to be planted deep. The church that you're going to lead is going to be planted deep in the soil of Ontario. It's going to stand for generations to come. Church, that wasn't just a, a word that was spoken over me. It wasn't a word for embassy or slate. It was a word for base church in this season. This is a church that is gonna be planted deep in the soil of Ontario that is gonna last for generations where you're not gonna be the only one to receive the gloriousness of God and, and the blessing of God in this season, but we are gonna see future generations blessed because of what God wants to do here at Base Church. The most important thing that we can ask in this season of our lives is what is God up to and how can I be a part of it? Waterloo Region is known for many different things. It's known for technology. The amount of tech companies that are emerging from our city right now is phenomenal. It's, it's mind-blowing. Before the pandemic, the numbers were this, that every week 10 new startups were, 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 were beginning, were getting their start every single week. It's known as a startup community. It's known as a, as a place where students come. We're known for our educational institutions. We have uh, nearly 100,000 students that ebb and flow out of our city every single year. There's 100,000 people. That is 20% of our total population that just comes and goes and, and they're coming from all parts of the world. So when Jesus says to go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, the incredible thing, something that Tim Keller uh, reminded us, uh, us of during his time here on earth, is he reminded us that if you go to the city and you reach the city, if you reach the city where all the world is coming to you, then you actually reach the entire world. The same thing happens in a region like ours where people from all over the world are descending upon Waterloo to get training. And if we could just reach our region, just reach the students in our region, and they go back to the places that they came from, we will effectively reach the entire world with the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. We will make disciples of all the nations by just reaching our society. Our, our, our city is not only known for education and and tech, but it's known for the businesses, the, the, um, the, uh, the insurance uh, companies that are here. It's known for a lot of different things. And yet it is my belief and in my heart that this is a region that will not only be known for these things that the world knows it for, but this is gonna be a region that is gonna be known for what Jesus is up to in our region. 
And I have a feeling that it's not just gonna be because of Base Church, but it's gonna be because of, of how we even interact with the churches in this area. I believe it's gonna be a place of revival, and I believe that God is preparing our hearts that what is happening right here in this region, in this place, and in this time, time frame will reverberate throughout our province and our nation as we remain obedient and faithful and curious to what God is up to in this place. A question I would ask a lot of us across this room is where are the people who are gonna make lifelong, lifetime decisions informed by the kingdom of God and not just by personal ambition? Who are the people? This is a question that John Tyson asked to his church and it's a question I'm asking us today. Where are the people that are gonna make lifetime decisions informed by the kingdom of God to root yourself in this region to see God do incredible things and not just make decisions rooted in personal ambition? The reality is, is that we need you. We need every single person across the screen right now. We need everybody. We need the single mom that is struggling to make ends meet. We need you. We need the student that thinks that this is only four years or maybe three years to simply get a degree in and move on to what you actually, we need you in this region. We need the person that thinks that maybe your best days are behind you and you've been serving God and you think maybe it's just time for the next generation to take over. No, we need you in this season child who's sitting there and maybe skipping kids ministry for whatever reason right now. You might be five years old. We need you. We need every single person in this church because the call of God on our church is not just for a select few that are doing a few things in the public right now and, 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 and just, just you know doing a, doing a few things with the few talents that we have. No, we need every single person operating in your God-given ability and the god gifting that God has given you to operate in the place that we call home in, in, in this season of our life but hopefully a lot longer than that. See, God has gifted you. And if it's just based on what I'm able to do or just based on what Emma's able to do or just based on what our location pastors are able to do or what the staff is able to do or maybe just a select few that think, oh, maybe I'm called to this as well, we're not gonna make it. We're not gonna make a dent. God needs every single one of us that is tuning in right now to realize that he's calling us to be a part of what he's up to in Ontario and in the Waterloo region. I wanna remind you of a story that I was impacted by and I was, of course, at a concert where we were being led by a whole bunch of different people in worship. And during that time, I, was, um, I felt a calling to ministry and I was asking God to take me somewhere warm. I wanted him, if you've heard the story, I wanted him to take me to California, Florida. I wanted to surf and pray for people. That was, that was young Brandon's dream of pastoring. I, I can tell you this, it's a lot harder than that. And I learned that pretty quickly. But in the midst of all this, at this concert that was put on, there's a bunch of Canadians that were gathered at the stadium where the Hamilton Bulldogs played, obviously in Hamilton. And as I was praying this prayer, God sent me somewhere where, where, where are you gonna have Emma and I plant a church? All of a sudden I began to recognize that every single person and every single band that was there leading us in worship or preaching a message was not from Canada. They're from the US, the UK, Australia, different parts of Europe. And yet there was not one Canadian represented on the stage. And I felt very specifically in my heart, the still small whisper, the rebuke of God for me calling, asking him to call me somewhere else. He said, Brandon, who's gonna take care of your own backyard? And do I think I'm the answer to Canada? Do I think I'm the answer to Ontario? Do I even think I or we are the answer to Waterloo Region? No. But I do believe that we're a part of the answer. And I believe that I'm responsible for my own backyard and that you're responsible for your own backyard. I wonder if those of us that have, have, have found ourselves on holy ground for, for years and maybe decades, I wonder if we got a little bit more curious and began to say, God, how are you seeing the back, my own backyard as holy ground? How are you trying to move? How are you looking to move on behalf of those that are crying out to you? God, how can I be an answer? How can my call be a part of the answer to the people that are crying out to you, whether they know they're crying out to the living God or not, how can I be a part of answering what people are looking for in, the, in their lives today here in Canada? You know, Moses, his response isn't a, here I am, Lord, send me after God says, I'm gonna to respond to the Israelites, so now go, I'm sending you. In fact, he begins to wrestle with God. I think some of us have been into wrestling with God for quite some time, and we need to relent to the pressure that we feel from the Holy Spirit and begin to say, God, I'm willing to be sent. Am I calling everybody to become pastors right now? No, 
I think there's some of us that are getting that call right now. And I believe that we're going to send you out as church planners all across this uh, province of ours because I believe that the best is yet to come for the church in Ontario. But I also believe right now that God is calling people to be faithful at their workplaces. People are being called to be faithful as they pick up their kids from daycare. I believe that people right now are being called to be faithful as we go out to our kids' soccer games and their baseball games, our hockey games. I believe right now God is calling us, no matter what we're doing in our lives right now, to do it with a little bit more intentionality, realizing that he's still in the business of releasing captives and we live in a world that desperately needs the freedom that he offers to us. What is the vision of Base Church? <laughs> We're already a number of minutes into our time together today, and you might be wondering, well, what is the vision then of Base Church? Here's what I believe about vision. I believe that vision's not a destination, but vision is a direction. I believe this because we read through um, scripture where Jesus says, men uh, plan in their hearts, but God really knows their future. Or he tells this story where um, uh, somebody's making decisions and they're planning for their future and they're setting things away and they're saving up. And, uh, and, 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 God, and Jesus goes, do you not realize that your life will be taken from you tonight? Another part, he says, listen, don't say I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that tomorrow and whatever else. It's up to the Lord. So rather say, Lord willing, I'm gonna do these things. The reality is that the vision of our church is Lord willing. <laughs> Lord willing, we're going to go in this direction and we're going to go in this direction. I believe that vision for our church is more of a direction that we're going to head in rather than a destination that I can guarantee you that we're going to get to. Because the reality is, is that God might actually have some different things for us on the way to pursuing his goal. What, what is the direction that God is calling us in? It's very simple. Three things to remember. I believe that God is calling base to build a healthy local church. I believe that God is calling base to be involved in education here in Ontario. And I believe that God is calling base to be a part of the renewal of the church in Ontario. Can we talk really briefly about building a healthy local church? There's a few different components. I believe that it means that we're gonna, uh, that we need to lean into gatherings. I believe that as our, our mission statement, our vision statement says that base church exists to worship God, equip the saints and reach Ontario, it's that order that's gonna get us on the right track. Our gatherings are a place where we can worship God together. The reality is, is that I believe that God's gonna ask us to add more rooms here in the future. What does that mean? I believe that here as a preach at City, that we're gonna actually begin to fill this space faster than we actually even realize. And we're gonna have to add more services than just two. Are we ready for that? Base Bloomingdale, we've had one service for quite some time. Are we ready to get back to two services? We believe in some way God might be calling us to do that in September. Are we willing to make more room for what God wants to do in our church? Gatherings are an incredible part of God's way of discipling his church because where we gather, we worship God and we're reminded collectively of his faithfulness. I believe that um, at, our, at our gatherings, we're, we're, also, we're also meant to represent the city that we live in. I believe that our churches are gonna grow more diverse. The reality is, is that one of the things we're gonna talk about when it comes to actually having, a, I'll just shift over to that right now. A part of having a healthy local church is having an impact in the city. We believe that base church impact is gonna be this thing that's gonna continue to grow. And one of the things on our heart is being at the forefront of actually welcoming newcomers to Canada and being some of the first people to introduce uh, or, or to welcome people and make them feel at home here in the Waterloo region. Why is that? Well, we believe that God has always been in the business of looking out for the marginalized and the oppressed. But also, I, I, I think it's funny when people say that this is the hardest time to plant a church. I agree. It's not an easy time. I think that there were easier times. But if we just even take the numbers of people that are immigrating to Canada and the percentage of them that are actually already Christian that are coming over, I think in some ways the secular society would start to reevaluate our immigration policies because they don't realize how many Christians are actually flooding into, uh, into the country that we call home. And this is a great thing for the church because if we can connect with newcomers uh, to Canada that are already Christians and begin to turn them into missionaries already on the ground reaching other newcomers to Canada, guess what? God is already moving in some of the spaces. As people come, they're all already be outposts and, and lighthouses for the gospel in our city. I believe that God is calling us to have a fair representation, even in our churches, at our gatherings, of what our city looks like. It would be great for our churches and our congregations to mirror the, the population that we see in our region. 
Let's continue with base church impact for a moment. Building a healthy church, it means reaching outside the four walls, welcoming newcomers to Canada, having things like impact center. This is one of the directions we believe that God is taking us. The specifics we'll figure out, but offering things like free mechanic work or, or free dentistry work or free counseling. What would it look like to be able to leave enough margin at some point in the future that we could start actually having impact centers where people know that if they can't receive it elsewhere, they could receive it from base church. We've already been involved in food and free markets where we give out, literally set up a grocery store here at City Center and we just give away food. More of that, please. Building a healthy local church looks like home bases, diving into greater degrees of biblical literacy, dealing with the, the, the pandemic of loneliness that is experienced across our society today. Being so integral to the um, place that we call home, that if we were to disappear as a church tomorrow, that the church or that the city would actually notice. Building a healthy local church means doing it as a team and building teams and not just relying on paid staff to do things, but actually enabling the staff to, uh, empowering the staff to enable volunteers to go out a multiplication strategy to actually care for all that God is actually calling us to do. A healthy local church means developing a, a healthy view of giving and, and one, of the, one of the things that we've been talking about as a staff as part of a, a, a healthy local church is actually starting up some side hustles. What would it look like to fund parts of the ministry based on some of the things that the church is doing, like a healthy cafe that's actually bringing in maybe a little bit of margin that we could put back into the mission or, or actually in the amount of space that we have, actually renting that out and then turning that back into dollars that can be used for God's mission. We believe here at Base Church, that part of the destination that God is, or the direction that God is calling us into, is to build a healthy local church. Base education, what does this mean? The direction we believe that God is calling us in direction, uh, when it comes to education, is not providing a retreat center for those that just want to retreat from the world and just huddle away and just learn about Christian things, but actually we want to create spaces where Christian worldview is actually taught so that we can engage with the world in a productive way. You know, we want to be involved in elementary and college. Um, one of the things that we're, we're going to be involved in over this next little while is Emmanuel Bible College goes through some shifts. We're actually stripping away at the college level. We're actually stripping away most of Emmanuel's current offerings, and we're just going with a one-year certificate program. But the goal of that is to create a space where people can discover their calling, be prepared for life, and sent out into the world that God is calling us to. You know, the reality is, is that we need Jesus-centered training institutions in the wake of a, of, a, of a failing educational model that's not just failing the church, but is currently failing society as a whole. The direction of renewal that we believe that God is calling us into as a church is to build a strong network of pastors that feel supported, that won't give up on ministry, that actually call people in their congregations to a higher a higher calling, much as we are doing today. It's partnering with these churches, coming alongside them when they feel hopeless, giving them and cheering them on. You know, when it comes to renewal of the church in Ontario, I think that this is something that we have to get in our hearts, and it can't just be in my heart or Emma's hearts as your pastors, but we gotta get this into our heart because I think that what it's also gonna take is a great deal of generosity coming from our church and going out to other churches. The reality is, is right now, you might not know this, but we provide uh, financial consulting to a number of churches here in Ontario already. We already do that as a way to serve the church in Ontario. We're already a part of establishing a network of churches with City Church and Brent, Pastor Brent Coulter, who's one of our overseers, where we already have a group of pastors that we're pouring into as a leadership team, our location pastors. We're just spending time with them and discussing things that are impacting our day and encouraging these pastors. One of the things that I think we'll also be involved in is making sure that we don't see property sold um, uh, and, and, and lost out of kingdom's hands, but actually being involved in, in somehow maybe creating a foundation where when we know that a, a church is going to sell their property, that somehow we retain that in the kingdom's hands, not in base church's hands, but in capital C church's hands, so that we can see the church flourish for generations to come. One of the things I know for sure that we'll be a part of is partnering with more churches 
We've already had a number reach out to us and say, hey, we would love to be a part of what's happening at base right now. And there's been a number that we say, hey, maybe, maybe that now's not the right time. But the reality is, is that there's one right now that we are also talking to going, God, might there be something here? And might you make that clear? Because we want to say only yes to the things you say yes to and no to the things that you say no to. I also know that it's going to involve planting. For some of us right now, we are cheering because next week, we will no longer be a mobile church. Guess what? In some way or another, base church will probably always be a mobile church. It will allow us to remind ourselves that church isn't meant to be easy, that there's more towns and cities and regions and municipalities to reach. The reality is when it comes to base church renewal, we believe that we are responsible. We're called to either plant or help renew a church in every municipality in Ontario. And when we first started saying that, I didn't realize that we have 444 municipalities here in Ontario. My guess is that we're the ones to start this dream, but it's gonna be our kids and their kids that are gonna continue on this dream. Our vision here at Base Church is not as much a destination as much as it is a direction. I learned this phrase not too long ago, and it's this phrase called opportunity leadership. And all this means is creating enough margin in what we're doing that we can respond to what God might actually be calling us to in any given season. So where does finances come into all of this? This is not just a vision series, but this is also a series where we're gonna, in a season, we're gonna be talking about personal finances, but we're also driving towards a, an above and beyond give on May 5th. What does, what, 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 how, where do finances actually come, uh, come to play in all of this? The reality is, is that nothing can move, the needle, needle cannot move unless people are involved. And that means with their time and their giftings, but it also means with the treasure, the things that God has given us. In some ways, I like to talk about giving back to God as returning. We're not really giving to God, we're just returning to God what he's already given, it, given to us. On May 5th, we'll gather for our Heart for the House, uh, our, our Heart for the House offering. And on that Sunday, what we're looking for is not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. What does that mean? There's some of us that have been really blessed financially and you might give a big, a, a big amount when it comes to Heart for the House Sunday. And that's gonna be incredible. But the reality is, is for those of us going, well, I might not be able to give that. The reality is, is that we're not looking for equal giving, but we're looking for equal sacrifice. And therefore the person that gives a lot might not actually be sacrificing as much as somebody who might be giving less, but proportionately to what they're actually going through, it might, it might actually be less. And so, um, when it comes to that Sunday, what we're looking for is for people to go, you know what, God, I want to see a move. I believe in where you're taking base church. We're not necessarily giving to something specific as much as we're giving to the vision and the direction that God is actually calling us to as a church. You know, I could sit here and tell you some of the building things that we want to do and some of the upgrades. I, I could tell you about septics and roofs and production systems and all the rest. The reality is, is that that doesn't stir us up as much as, God, could you actually move through our church? Can you actually move us along in the direction that you're calling us to? And the reality is, is that in some ways, I believe that the vision is going to move at the speed at which we're willing to give towards what God's calling us to, not just financially, but also with our time and our talents, as well as our treasure. Church, we have been blessed, and I believe that we are blessed to be a blessing. And if we are faithful with a little, we'll be given more. That's not a prosperity thing, that's a stewardship principle. The reality is, is that God has always used what I've um, learned and, and, and begun to now call gospel patrons. God has always used gospel patrons, those that have come alongside the work of the ministry and funded it so that the ministry might actually move forward at an expedited rate. We see this with Jesus and the woman that followed him, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna in Luke chapter eight one to three, we see that these women literally funded the work of the ministry and furthered the work of the gospel for Jesus. Um, in a book called Gospel Patrons, the author says this, behind every great movement of God, generous business leaders and people have partnered with those who proclaim the gospel. Uh, in this book, he said, God raises up people to proclaim the gospel, but he also raises up patrons to support them. 
And it goes on to tell the story of a successful cloth merchant who in the 1500s was thrown into prison for funding William Tyndale to translate the Bible in English. Or in 1700s, where a wealthy aristocrat named Lady Huntington sold her jewelry and risked her reputation to partner with the leading preacher of the Great, Great Awakening, George Whitfield. The reality is, is that God has always used the returning of what God has given his people to further the vision and the mission that God has called people to. I've experienced this in my own life. When Peter, one of the people that has long served on our boards as a church, dropped off some money at my house when we were really struggling and only making $1,000 a month, he dropped some money off and I can tell you this, it kept me going. We've seen this with the red toolbox at Bloomingdale. We had our breakthrough offerings and we believed that God was gonna do breakthrough by our extra giving every single month. You can almost envision Heart for the House as like a, the, we're, we're gonna do it once a year at this stage, but, but almost as that breakthrough offering that God has used in the past to do incredible things for his good and, and for his call. We've seen this um, through families committing to support the building at Bloomingdale. We've seen this at our last Heart for the House. Before we had merged, Slate Church had done an offering similar to this and gave $430,000, which was pretty much standard for what had been given in the, in the previous year. It's so much sacrificial giving so that we could actually do the renovations on this property that I'm standing on right now, giving this message. God has been good to us, church, and I believe that he's calling us to something even greater. The reality is that we have always been standing on holy ground. My question to you today is, are you willing to be curious enough with God to begin to discover what he might be calling you to today? And would you be um, willing and open enough to hear from God that might, might, might God actually be calling you to respond to the cry of his creation? as creation begins to groan out to him, even in these last days, and begin to get a heart for your, for your life, begin to get a vision for your own life, get a vision for Base Church, and begin to release your treasure, your talent, and your time back to God. Over the next four weeks, we're gonna talk more about this. Church, I love you. I believe the best is yet to come. Yes, God has done some incredible things in all of our past, but it's not even scratching the surface of what we're gonna see into the future. I believe it with all my heart because God is not done with Ontario. He's not done with Waterloo Region. He's not done with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all that you're stirring in our church right now. God, I'm glad that I don't have to work myself into an emotional position to believe that you're actually moving, but God, I just have to look with a little bit of curiosity and I can see your fingerprints all over this region and this province. God, this nation that we call home, you are raising up godly men and women and they're taking the lead in your church here all across this nation. So God, I pray that as we respond here in our corner of the country, here in Waterloo Region, God, I pray as we hear this vision and you wake in our hearts, God, I pray that you would send us home a blaze, a fire filling us with a, a desire to carry your will in this place that we call home. God, I pray that you would just continue to speak to us as a church over this season called Heart for the House. God, I pray that you would speak to us of what we should give. I pray that you would speak to us on what you're calling us to. God, I pray that you would speak to us on what gifts and, and talents we should give. God, I pray that even in the quiet moments of our weeks in between Sundays, that you would be speaking to us as your church as to what you would have us do. I pray this in your mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.